Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, it's a great pleasure to introduce Joppe Boss from NXP in Leuven, Belgium. It's great to have the boss man back here this week. <laughs> And he will be talking about cryptanalyzing uh, white box cryptographic designs. Uh, this is actually work uh, that last week received the best paper award at the chess conference in Santa Barbara. Okay. So thank you, Michael. Yeah, and thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, for inviting me, especially Brian, of course, that I come uh, could come and visit his group uh, this week. It's great to be back here. So I spent. Two, two and a half years here as a postdoc, and uh, it all looks still very familiar. Uh, it's, yeah, it's really nice to be back and be able to talk about the more yeah, recent things I've been doing, which is a little bit different than the things I was working on here. So, yeah, as Michael mentioned, I want to talk about white box uh, implementations. So if you have no clue what this is, don't worry, I, will, I didn't know it two years ago. Uh, I will try to give an overview of what they are, why they are used now in practice, and why they're becoming a hot topic again. And then I will show a new uh, type of attack uh, we came up with, which uh, breaks all the current white box designs. Um, so currently I'm at uh, NXP Semiconductors. So one slide of if you have not heard of NXP. Um, so actually our company is growing quite a bit, so I think last year we merged with a big American company, Freescale, um, which almost doubled our size. Um, so our headquarters are in Eindhoven, so we're a Dutch-based uh, company. So as Michael said, I'm, I'm now in Leuven, in a research lab uh, in Belgium. Um, and as you can see, we have quite some R&D labs all around the world. So here in the US, it's uh, since Freescale is mainly in Austin and in San Jose. Are you bigger than Philips? It's 45,000 employees, or Philips is big? That's a good question now. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're doing, uh, I mean, in terms of, of stock values and everything, we're doing significantly better than Philips. But if we're bigger, that's a good question. I'm not sure because Philips is indeed selling lots and lots of divisions. So I'm going uh, to divest itself of the lighting divisions. Exactly. Yeah. They are focusing on medical equipment now. All right. So, introduction to white box. So, if you're want to talk about the security of a cryptographic implementation. Of course, as we all know, you should try and ask yourself, what does it mean to be secure? So in what environment, in what setting, who's the attacker? Um, so we assume we have two parties, a sender and a receiver. They want to communicate with each other or do something. And we assume there's an attacker somewhere. So initially, um, so you ask yourself, what is the security notion um, we want to define? So, and in our case, our security notion, we split it in two. So it's the attacker's goal. What does he want to achieve? So it might be that he wants, so as we will see in white box, he wants to extract your secret key from your implementation. But actually, that is the model I will work with. But in practice, the attacker is often satisfied with much less. If you can just copy the functionality of decryption, for instance, that is something an attacker uh, might be happy with uh, as well. Then, of course, how does he want to achieve this goal? So that's his model. And then, of course, when you try to show the security, you want to try to, um, as realistically as possible, model uh, this. So what kind of models um, do we know? And that's where the term, uh, the white box model, comes from is that from the 80s, we know we have this, this black box model, right? Uh, I think we all know it. This is what you learn at school. So you have just the two parties. They want to talk to each other. And the adversary can just uh, yeah, observe the communication going over the line. And you assume that the endpoints are trusted. And that's it. Then in the late 90s, um, it was really shown that this model is not realistic. Um, so there was the, the famous paper by Kocher, uh, Jaffa and June in Crypto99 introducing the first side channel attacks. 
Um, and that was related to cryptographic hardware implementations. Actually, it's timing attack from Australia. Ninety-six. Started the. So, the indeed, so side yes, a timing attack is indeed definitely a form of this meta information you could use. Yeah. Um, so what's the idea here? So you have your. Um, so this is what, is what people call the, the gray box model. So indeed, you have, for instance, time or power or some other, for instance another meta information you could use from your implementation. So that are the passive attacks. So you observe this meta information and using this meta information, um, there are many, many techniques how one could deduce um, the secret key which is used during the execution of your cryptographic hardware implementation while you observe this meta information. But then there are lots of active attacks an adversary could perform as well. So there are fold injections, you could try to modify the hardware or modify the environment where this uh, cryptographic hardware implementation is running. And so this, so the whole chess conference, so which took place uh, last week, is really dedicated to these types of attacks. And then, as you can see here, the, the list of these attacks grows every year. So they get more advanced and there are more and more countermeasures. So this is well understood at the moment. Then in the beginning of the 2000s, um, it became clear that this model didn't capture everything. And that's where the name white box model comes from. And that is essentially when you switch from hardware implementations to software implementations. Um, people uh, started to use, uh, or now start to use smartphones or mobile phones or for transit applications, um, cryptographic software implementations only. Um, so there's no additional hardware support to protect you. Um, but initially, the white box model was introduced for DRM applications. So the first paper was in 2002 by Chow uh, et al. And it was really targeted at digital right management. And this is called uh, the white box model. So what's the goal here is the goal is you have a software implementation. So that's the main difference between the gray box model and you want to run the software implementation on your architecture, but you want to protect the key it's using. Um, but you assume that the adversary can be the user of this software implementation, which means since he has this cell phone or this device in his hands, he can do more or less anything he wants. You assume he's root of the device, so he can perform static analysis, a dynamic analysis. He can just inspect the memory, run it in a debugger, halt it at any moment, change registers, uh, inject faults, change the implementation. And against all these types of attacks, the secret key or uh, should remain secret from the person running this implementation. So it's a pretty yeah, strong model. So why are people interested in this model? So it's clear from the, from the gray box setting, but why um, is this white box setting now becoming, uh, yeah, gives rise to more people actually looking at it. So as I said, the original use case is digital right management. So what's the use case here? So consider you have some streaming content coming in, uh, let's say a movie, um, this comes encrypted. So you decrypt it on your set-top box or on your mobile phone, for instance. Um, with your cryptographic key, but you are not allowed to know this cryptographic key because if you would know it, you could give this key to a friend and then he could decrypt the incoming traffic as well. Um, so this was the, the DRM setting, which is still definitely used in practice. But it uh, sparked a lot of more interest uh, now due to H something called HCE. So this is host card emulation. Um, and the emulation part, uh, is the main the essential word here because it means that we're going to emulate a secure element. So the setup is as follows. So host card emulation allows you, for instance, to pay using a near field communication, uh, pay in a store with your mobile phone, for instance, or in transit applications. And um, you could do that, of course, where all your uh, cryptographic material is stored on secure hardware but it's now becoming more and more popular to do everything in software because then your phone, for instance, not all phones will have a secure element. And then it's called host card emulation and then everything is simply done uh, on your phone. And then of course the question becomes how we're gonna protect this key because why do you need to protect your key? 
An easy example is if you have a transit application, um, you might pay for your ride, and then if you have the key, you could just roll back and uh, put your balance back to the old balance. And that's something, of course. Uh, Actually, uh, an emerging application of this is uh, in uh, what's known as uh, soft SIM. You know that Apple is interested in replacing the SIM card uh, with something that will behave like any uh, yeah. any service provider SIM, and then you will not have to switch SIM cards. Exactly, because the SIM card is is a secure element as well. And if you would emulate now to get yeah, rid of the exactly, SIM. and if you would emulate that, indeed, so that that that's that's more or less the same. So there are lots and lots of applications, and then of course, uh, so how are people solving this problem? So this one of the main or one of the main ingredients of the solution is a white boxed implementation um, and then of course the question arises is this actually secure or not or what's the security of these implementations if you just move away from hardware to software solutions um, so in practice there's now a huge demand for this so in 2014 both visa and mastercard announced that they um, would support HCE, um, which was a big step so if you would now implement anything for your mobile phone, for instance, or you want to do payment, um, it's mandatory to implement uh, or protect it with a white box implementation. Um, and as you can see, it's expected um, that the points of sale, both here in the US and in Europe, will go, uh, which support uh, NFC, will go significantly up. And also all of the phones, so not only the high-end phones, but all phones, um, with NFC support is expected to go up significantly as well in the upcoming years. So the, then, of course, the applications for paying with your mobile phone uh, is expected to go up a lot as well. Um, and the protocols used uh, these, in these payment protocols use uh, AES or, or uh, triple DES. So they need to protect AES or DS keys. And again, this is done uh, with white box cryptography. So this is, I mean, big business. So why do we need to look at some... Good business for NXP, by the way? Uh, that depends. <laughs> NXP is going to uh, sell uh, such uh, so software so implementations? That at the moment, we don't sell any software implementations. But um, if it really takes off, so uh, that's... You up up. all your uh, secure elements. Exactly. So, it, so then, of course, it would be better if we cannibalize our own market than if somebody else is doing it. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so at the moment we do not sell any uh, secure software-only software solutions. Um, so why would you need any um, white box implementation? Why not use conventional crypto? Um, so if you would just take a regular software-only implementation and you would run it in, but then it's not secure in this white box model. So an easy way to see, so there's an old result uh, by Adi, um, that if you... Yes. <laughs> you would just uh, scan the, the memory used of your device and then with a very high probability, if you hit a high entropy region, the, this is where your cryptographic key would be stored. Um, so then you could just do a memory dump, which is allowed in the white box attack model, and then you just extract your key and you're done. Another attack which you could think of um, in the case uh, of symmetric crypto is some sort of a software fault injection. So if you just have your S-Box, you would just erase um, the location of your S-Box, you make it all zero, and then when you, when you compute the S-Box step, I mean, it just simply outputs the key. Um, so then you have extracted your key. So we need some different techniques to, be, uh, to try and be secure uh, in this model. Yeah. Yes? So is it only the key that you're trying to, to hide? Because like, so... I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. Because I could extract the bits, right, this, the program, I will come exactly to that. So that's a very good. You're not supposed to understand what those bits stand for. No, but it's 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 a very good remark. Uh, I, I okay, I can quickly talk about it now. So, for the purpose of this talk, I, I'm interested in just uh, extracting the secret key from the white box implementation. But what you say is absolutely true. What you could of course do is um, on my mobile phone, if I have my white box uh, cryptographic implementation, I can just copy this implementation and put it on another device, um, then I don't know the secret key, but I've copied the functionality of decryption, for instance, and then I can still watch movies or make payments or whatever. So that's an attack called code lifting. Um, 
that's a different type of attack and people try to guard themselves against these type of attacks by binding the implementation to the user, to the cloud, to the platform. So you have all these platform binding, user binding techniques. But that are different types of techniques. But yeah, this is a well studied uh, and well understood but difficult to solve problem. The rewinding is another kind of attack. You don't understand uh, what is the key, and uh, you don't want to uh, be able to apply the functionality, but you just want uh, to restore the uh, current state to an earlier state. Yes. For example, in the example you gave of uh, yes, paid it, for something. For rollback. Yeah, so you yeah. have lots of, yes, that's a different type of attack. So you want to have anti-rollback uh, protection in there as well. So let's take a step back. And let's look at, try to look at this first slightly from a theoretical point of view. So of course, what you're trying to do is you're trying to hide your key in your implementation. So this can, of course, be seen as a form of code obfuscation. Um, but it's a well-known result um, from Crypto 2001 that obfuscation of any program uh, is impossible. But the example they gave there is a bit contrived example. Um, and I mean, it's an open question if the family of all the white box functions or the functions we want to white box, so the cryptographic primitives, um, can be obfuscated or not. I mean, it could be perfectly possible that they can or, or not. I mean, we don't know. And then an interesting observation is, and that's actually one of the observations that led us to look into this, is that if there would be a secure white box implementation, then by definition, this would be secure against all the current and future side channel uh, and fault attacks because it should simply not leak anything uh, because that's the definition. You are allowed to inspect the program and all its surroundings and everything there. And if you can use any of that to extract the private key, then, it, then it's game over. But this is a really strong statement. Um, so this, I mean, and we will see that in practice, um, this does not hold and this allowed us to uh, extract the secret key. But in practice, um, how does it work? So there are only results known how to make white box implementations for symmetric key algorithms. Um, and then it should be said that all academic designs have been broken um, in academia. Um, but still lots of companies are selling symmetric and asymmetric designs, but it's completely unknown what they're doing. Um, and But the basic approach, so what's the the high level ID, and I will, in a couple slides, I will try to explain how people do this in practice, is that you, conf you try to convert your algorithm to a sequence of lookup tables. So every algebraic step, you would convert to a lookup table. So for instance, if you have AES, you work on bytes. So every time you work on bytes, you convert that to a lookup table. And then the idea is when the key is used, you merge that in the lookup table and you put encodings on this lookup table in the hope to obfuscate uh, the data in it that an attacker is not able to extract the, the secret key material. And that it immediately explains why it doesn't work for asymmetric, because we don't know how to convert RSA or elliptic curve-based operations to a sequence of small lookup tables. And we can do that for AES and DES. Um, so is white box impossible? So of course it's not. Um, I could create an ideal white box AES implementation. You just make a huge lookup table which maps all the, when your key is fixed, you map all your inputs to all the outputs. No way to extract the key, right? It's only, I mean, you need uh, quite a bit of uh, storage. So it, even the recent phones uh, don't have that much of storage. So um, this is not practical. So we're gonna look for practical white box implementations. And so the original ID by Chow uh, and others uh, was to use, a, uh, <coughs> resulted in a white box, a yes implementation, of uh, 700 kilobytes. So how, how did that work? So uh, let's quickly go over their design. So like I said, the idea is you're gonna merge the steps with your key. So if you have your S box, um, you XOR your secret key in. So let's call that step T. And so for simplicity, I will just uh, omit the shift row operations, that's just renumbering. And then um, the mixed column operation, you can split in four and then you just XOR them together. So then we come to using two types of lookup tables. So T followed by M, we merge them into one lookup table and the XORs. Of course, um, this, it, 
I mean, now we have a whole sequence of lookup tables, but this will not help us at all. Just by looking at it, you can just simply extract the key. So the idea is to put some obfuscation on top of these lookup tables. So the idea is, the first idea is we're going to put linear uh, encodings on top of these lookup tables. So we have this AI, so we now assume we get an AI inverse as input, then that's removed, um, and then we do all these steps. So if you look at this, this rectangle, so that's the one lookup table. So all these things inside are just accumulated in the lookup table. And we do the same for this linear encoding MB. And then of course, this is in the same way as the mixed column removed later. And like I said, everything is merged. But besides using linear encodings, we're going to use also nonlinear encodings. So that are the green uh, boxes here. But they need to be removed immediately because they're nonlinear. Um, and that results to lots and lots of lookup tables. So now your implementation is actually not computing anything, it's just doing table lookups. And that's why the size of the implementations in practice are quite a bit bigger than regular AES. And so this approach was the first approach uh, by Chow et al. And then there are subsequent approaches which are all variants of this approach. But like I said, they are all broken. So in practice, um, white box is just one ingredient of a whole bunch of layers you use to create a secure software implementation which should be secure in this white box attack model. So people you use especially code obfuscation and these things are very advanced nowadays. Um, you try to glue your binary to the environment, so that's what we said, to protect against uh, code lifting. Maybe you want some sort of traitor tracing in there that if your binary leaks, then you can still find out where it leaked from. Um, and very important, because it's software, um, which allows you to do updating compared to hardware. So the idea behind white box implementations is that you update frequently such that an attacker just needs to doesn't have enough time to actually break it and scale up uh, his attack. Um, so this year at uh, Eurocrypt, there was a very interesting invited talk uh, called Engineering Code Obfuscation by Christian Kohlberg, which went in into all the details of these other techniques. So the anti-debugging, the code obfuscation, and all these parts, and showed how hackers and, and industry play this cat and mouse game with these different techniques. But he didn't go much into uh, the white box crypto part, but, and that is exactly the part I want to focus on. So like I said, all the previous attempts um, to, to cr create white box implementations were broken, so what else, what can we do more? Um, but if you look up in a bit more detail at what was needed there, um, all these attacks were very white box sp specific. What does it mean is you need to know what kind of white box approach was implemented, um, which type of encodings were used, uh, by which cipher operations, exactly in which lookup table. And once you knew this, um, then you got your white box implementation, you spent lots of effort removing uh, the code obfuscation by reverse engineering your binary. Once you have it reverse engineered, you can access the lookup tables and you would perform your algebraic attack. That, that, that was the, the general recipe how to break uh, white box implementations. So in, in the approach I'm going to introduce in, in the remainder, um, it works automatic. The only thing you need to know is which algorithm is implemented. So in practice, there are only two choices. It's either AES or DES. Um, and once you know this, then the attack works automatically. You don't need any knowledge of where what is implemented. And we don't care about code obfuscation. No matter how strong the code obfuscation, the key would just fall out. And this is done with a concept, um, so the software part of what the people in the gray box community, so the hardware community, they use power traces or traces um, measuring the radiation coming out of your device. And we will have the software counterpart, which are software traces. So what are software traces? Um, so you have to understand that when you get a white box implementation in practice, it's just a binary. It's not source code. You just get a binary executable which sits on your mobile phone, for instance. Um, so then the, the idea we had was, let's use the nowadays available very powerful dynamic binary instrumentation tools like PIN or Fallgrind. So, in, so if you're a software engineer, the chances are high that you have worked with either Intel PIN or with Fallgrind, for instance, to do uh, memory checking. Um, but these frameworks are much, much more powerful and they can do much more. So we wrote 
plugins to these powerful frameworks, which if you run your uh, software implementation, it would record all the memory accesses made. So you just get a list of memory accesses done over time while executing your implementation. And as the name says, so Intel PIN runs on all the Intel platforms uh, and Fallgrind uh, runs on the same but also on ARM, which is of interest because then you can run it on your uh, on mobile devices as well. So then beside these plugins, we wrote a visualizer so you can visualize uh, your software traces. And I want to show some examples because we will use this visualization to determine, because we needed to only know one thing, are we running which algorithm is being run. Um, and that is why we use this visualization. So here on the y-axis you see the time going from top to bottom, and on the x-axis you see the, the memory locations addressed. So this GUI was based on a tool called Petra, uh, which was an unreleased Quarks Lab tool presented at one of the hacker conferences in France. Um, but yeah, it was unreleased, so we just um, made our own uh, visualizer. So here you see in black are the instructions being accessed in memory. Uh, green are the memory reads and red are the memory writes. So this is just a typical example what a software trace would look like. So here's the code, the stack, and the data being accessed. Um, so if we look at a typical white box implementation, it will look like this. So you see a whole bunch of things are going on. But if you zoom in on, on this little uh, thing there, you would notice that this is the crypto, because here we have, you see a pattern of 9 times 4, which suggests that it's computing AES, because the 10th round uh, is slightly different and it's probably merged uh, uh, in that last blob. So what if the implementer is they get creative and they try to hide what they're doing, of course, because that's the whole goal with white box implementation. So they, they completely unrolled their code. Um, and then this doesn't show us anything. It doesn't give us any clue uh, what algorithm is being computed. It's just a straight line uh, of the instruction. But then, of course, we can just look at the memory being accessed. And here we see nicely that this 1 plus 15 times, it does a nice lookup in memory. So this probably tells us that with high probability, it's computing DES. But then if we have a smarter uh, implementation, which also makes just a linear uh, sweep through memory as well, um, and then the idea is, if you can see on the right, there's a tiny fraction of memory here. That's called the stack. And it's really difficult to hide uh, data access on the stack. So if you zoom in there, so this is, uh, if we zoom on there, you see this. And again, we will just see uh, that we're computing, uh, that DES is computed. From the, from the stack access. All right, now, so what? We have determined what algorithm uh, is being computed. How are we going to actually extract the keys? So the idea is um, to use similar attacks. We are well studied from the hardware community. So one slide overview, if you've never seen how DPA, so differential power analysis attacks work. Um, so the idea is that, so here we have an AES implementation. Um, and in hardware it would run, and then you would start measuring power, uh, for instance, power. And then you would, at one point, of course, you are at the point that subbytes is computed, so where you're, you do um, a lookup table which depends on your key. And then you would use these power traces and try to correlate them to guesses. And then uh, when, the when you have enough traces, you have a high correlation when the correct key is used, and then you can just extract or determine one by one, all the key bytes of your AES secret key. So this is a very now well-studied uh, attack for hardware implementations. So what could we do? So we take our white box implementations, we put it on a smart card, and we just do our hardware attack. We measure the power of the smart card, and we're done. So this would be very stupid, of course, um, because I just explained to you we have these software traces. So. What can we do there? So for instance, uh, one idea is we take only one byte of these memory lookups. Um, so then we get 8-bit data reads of all the, the memory being accessed. Um, and this gives us 256 possible values for our, our trace. Can you repeat exactly what the, uh, the axis, x and y axis here? Oh, so here, this is just, uh, this is the time. 
and here these are just uh, the, the value of the one byte. Uh, the, the sorry, the address. The address of the memory of the least significant byte of the address. So that's why this goes from 0 to 256, and then uh, just over time. But then, of course, um, but the bytes are dominated by their most significant bit. I mean, that makes sense. So we can learn from the gray box model. So there, uh, in, for hardware implementations, they work in this Hemming weight model. Um, so let's take the Hemming weight of these bytes. So then we have reduced these 256 different values to only eight. Um, and actually, this works in practice. If you do this, then you can already break um, but you need lots of traces, but you can break, uh, you, can ex you can do a correlation and then extract the secret key. But we can do much better in practice. Um, because this Hemming weight was really for the hardware model. And we're not in the hardware model, we're in the software model. So the key is to realize that every bit in this address is equally important. So let's just serialize uh, the bytes. So then we get a trace, which is extremely boring. It's just a thing over time, just with two possible values, a zero or a one. But why is this much more powerful? It's because we're not in the hardware setting. It's very different. So because we measure our traces without any error. Um, while on the hard so this would be the hardware analog of probing the individual bus lines on your hardware and then measure without any error. So, I mean, in, in, in the gray box model, this is not possible, but we are in this super nice setting where we have uh, error-free traces. So when we do this, uh, so this is what we did. So we serialized, and then, of course, your trace does not correspond to time anymore because um, memory addresses, it's just now uh, they are in succession, so it's not exactly corresponds to, to time. Um, but we applied this attack to four different um, white box challenges which were put online. But I still don't see the attack. You described how you uh, get a graph, but uh, right. referring to it as an attack, and, uh, how do you get the key out? So the idea now is if you have obtained uh, such software traces that you would just run your regular DPA attack with such traces. And, and that's it. So you would it's not necessarily optimal. Uh, you are, you know, like a mathematician who is uh, changing problem A to problem B because he knows already how to solve problem B. But uh, you might have a better use of the fact that you know how every uh, address in memory is being accessed. Yes. And you're ignoring it. You're saying, let's... No, but that's what we're using here, right? Here, this trace tells you exactly which values in memory are accessed, and now we're going to try to uh, make a correlation between this information and our key guesses, um, and that is exactly what DPA is doing. Okay. So... In some sense, you have more power than... Uh, exactly, so this is much more powerful, um, because these things are error-free, and you will see in practice they're much more powerful because we need much less traces. That's the result. Um, so, of course, we wanted to try this attack, and the attack indeed is, so that's why we called it, it DCA, so Differential Computational, uh, analysis because it's just DPA but with software traces slightly massaged, so you, you, you serialize them. Um, so the, there are four white box challenges posted online. So the first one was by Brecht Weisseur in 2007. Um, so let's have a look. So that was the picture we saw before. So that is a design... Based on the idea of lookup tables. So this approach is based on the original paper by Chow. Uh, plus some personal improvements by himself. So he didn't specify what, he just said plus personal improvements. Um, but it's just a lookup table based white box. And the size of each uh, lookup table is again in the range of 700? Yeah, I think, yeah, it was around one, two megabyte was this implementation. Um, and then, so if you, this is the example we saw before. So that was from the, the visor challenge. Um, so this was DES and it was really easy. Um, we only needed 65 software traces. And it's not like in hardware that uh, obtaining a software trace, you have your oscilloscope, it takes a long time to get a trace. Getting a trace is mi milliseconds, right? You just run it and you have it. Um, so obtaining 65 traces, I mean, took, it was less time 
to run the attack than download this, this, this binary from online. So another challenge. Um, so these two challenges are both from hacker conferences uh, in Europe. They were designed, of course, to be able to be broken, um, not with this attack, but with these algebraic attacks which were around. Um, and they were much easier to, to break. So here we see um, from the first one a software trace. If you look at the stack, so here you can see nicely the 10 rounds uh, of AES. And this was very easy to break, because, but it makes sense because they didn't put uh, these nonlinear encodings on these intermediate lookup table rounds because they wanted the participants to be able to break this within a day. Um, but in practice, that means that we only needed 16 traces and then simply there was enough correlation to, to just extract the key. And the same uh, hold it for this other implementation. The last one is slightly more interesting. So it's an implementation by a master student called uh, CleanEdge. Um, so he implemented in his master thesis AES using uh, the approach by Karomi. So that is the, the last attempt to fix um, white boxed AES. So later, again, that was shown to be broken with algebraic attacks. Um, and that, that was this picture. So why this trace looks slightly different than other traces? Because he implemented everything with this C++ library called Boost, which is like this massive beast around everything. And then the crypto part is just this tiny part and the rest is just all the C++ uh, sitting around it. Um, and here initially it was interesting. So the Kar Karomi's approach is using dual ciphers. So use affine equivalences of AES to try and hide what you're doing. Um, and here we had some difficulty because not all the, the key bytes um, came out as the highest correlation. So what happened was that um, in the implementation for these encodings, they tried to balance everything to hide any effect of the correlation. Um, that's the property they use. And, but then, for instance, you can see here, for these are the, the bits in the byte, the individual bits in the 16 bytes of the AES key we target. And you see often um, the correct key uh, bit comes out at number one. So then uh, our attack was successful. But very often they come out at position 256, so the, the lowest position. And you, so here you can graphically see that here. So the circled one is actually the uh, correct one. And you can see the line here, the correlation is much flatter than the other one surrounding it. So what does that mean is that there was an encoding chosen which tries to really hide this value much, much better. So it tries to make it as best as possible. Um, but by doing this, it really stood out because it was really the best one. So when you run a correlation, it consistently is one of the lowest. So it's either 256 or 254. Only sometimes uh, it, it turns up in the middle. So in order, so this is already was enough information then to break it when we saw this. But if you just want to look at the top one positions, what you could do is, so this is the same table as on the previous slide. Um, you just target the same scheme at a different spot and then you just combine it. And then it's just a matter of brute forcing 100 values or something uh, for your AES key and then you have it. So. With this approach, so initially we needed 2,000 traces, which is significantly higher than, for instance, the 65 in the Visor challenge. Um, but later we were able to reduce this to 500, which is still significantly more, um, but still not much when you realize that obtaining a software trace takes no time at all. So now we talked about, so this worked against all the, the published uh, challenges, so but- I want to understand the point that bothers me. You yes. are only looking at the sequence of addresses being accessed yes. in the lookup tables. And addresses could easily be manipulated by uh, changing the order uh, in which uh, you store the values in the table. And uh, uh, therefore, it's not clear to me why the sequence of locations is giving you uh, direct information about the key. Uh, the, when you think about how uh, power analysis works, it works because if, for example, you saw the key with uh, an input byte which you knew and the result was zero, it cons uh, consumed less power. So you knew something about the value being generated in the, uh, in the middle step. Because the key XORed uh, an input byte, 
is uh, low hanging weight result, which is written to memory. But you are not getting any information about values. You are no, only getting address. information about addresses. Yes. And this is confusing because uh, I could uh, write uh, the same table with a permuted uh, order in which uh, the values are stored in memory. And therefore, uh, you will find it difficult to use the information from the uh, addresses being accessed. Yeah, so Why is it I think your, your question consists of two parts. So the first part is, why not look at the values instead of the addresses? Right. So that's because of all these encodings um, okay. which are put on top of it. And then your second remark. But if it worked for the values, why doesn't the same uh, encoding uh, work uh, when I'm going to uh, apply some uh, crazy function to the address bits? You hid their, uh, their uh, values by encoding. Uh, uh, you know, before the, the point at which the lookup table happened and afterwards. You had a mapping, nonlinear mapping, and yeah. the inverse. But suppose I did uh, the same thing, added some uh, uh, transformation to the address bits. Wouldn't it have the same uh, uh, successive effect? Yes, so that depends. So I'll come to that later. It depends how, how wide your encodings are. So I, I will, so here uh, as well. Talk about it and if, uh, someone didn't try to hide yes, the so information contained in addresses. Your other remark was to, um, what did you say? This is, uh, so yeah, if, if you try to permute right. the order of things in the table. So that would actually be so, um, things are permuted, but with a fixed permutation. So for every time you run your white box, it would use the same permutation. But for every white box instance, it would be different. Um, but I can think about ways of modifying Exactly, so now, but this was not done before. So with all the current white box implementation, they didn't do this. So now, of course, we come, and that's why I say there's a lot of potential for follow-up work, because now we come to the point, what type of countermeasures can we think which would, I mean, there are obviously countermeasures, which would make this attack not work. Um, so the first approach you think of, this is an attack more or less borrowed from the gray box attack model. Let's look at the countermeasures which are applied there. And then the first problem is that almost all the countermeasures there require random data. So if you look at the popular countermeasures, it's uh, masking uh, and these types of things. So you generate a random mask and then you, you mask your data and unmask it later. Um, but in the white box attack model, masking will not work um, because I can just disable the random number generator. I can set the entropy to zero. Um, then you might think, for instance, I'm going to add random delays, which they might do in hardware. But again, that needs random data. So then you can think, maybe I can get some static random data from the white box itself. So how would that work? So the only fresh bits you get from your white box implementation is your input. So you might think of a way of using the input as some sort of PFRG or something to use within the white box a random number or pseudo random number generator to get random values. And actually, it's a really interesting uh, uh, suggestion. What if you have your lookup tables or something else which you're going to use to instantiate your white box if these are permuted or changed every iteration? Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a very interesting idea. And as far as I know, that has not been done before. So, um, but yeah. That, that would be, and then of course the follow-up question is, or if you look first at the more practical side of things, um, one could look at if an implementation could detect that it's hooked in one of these D DBI frameworks, then it could just output wrong results. Uh, so then of course this attack also wouldn't work. So this is an active area because there are lots of companies working on this anti-emulation, anti-debug, um, which is more or less the same as anti-DBI. Um, but there are lots and lots of hackers out there who are very good at anti-anti-debug and anti-anti-emulation. So this is again a cat and mouse game and it seems like the hackers are, are always catching up. Um, and then of course, it should really be noted, so D DCA will not always work. So when talking about encodings, in practice what people do, let's for, for instance take the lookup table for XOR. So 8 bits come in, 8 bits come out. Um, the nonlinear encodings are typically split up in two, so a 4-bit and a 4-bit. Why is that? Because then uh, your lookup tables are smaller. Uh, and then, I mean, not everything explodes. You only need to have 2 to the 4 instead of 2 to the 8. 
Um, but if you would use the full nonlinear encoding, of course, we don't learn anything because uh, everything gets hidden. Um, so then DCA will definitely not work, but you get larger lookup tables and the algebraic attacks will still apply. So it will only help against this specific attack. Then, and so we were just brainstorming here what types of things might work. So using uh, IDs from threshold implementations, uh, they might actually uh, help as well, but that's also to be determined. But then, these are the countermeasures. When you look at the type of attacks, um, we just applied DPA. So it's the most simple uh, type of uh, yeah, side channel attack. Um, but there, like I said, people know much, much more. So what about other attacks? So Riskier, so an evaluation lab from the Netherlands, they came um, out with a similar attack independently of us, slightly after us. Uh, and they studied in much more detail software fault attacks against white box implementations. And they were quite successful as well. So even if DCA might fail in certain instances, it might just be that you can do a software fault attack and uh, the secret key comes out. But these are just two types. What about higher order attacks? Does it even make sense to run higher order attacks against software implementation? What against CPA or all, all the other attacks uh, which are out there in, in the gray box model? I don't know whether it's uh, the right time, but I have another completely different type of attack which uh, uses a different principle. Do you want me to wait until the end or it's a good no, time? No, no, it's time. perfect. I'd be happy to uh, <laughs> work with you more about it. Basically, if you are looking at uh, the inputs to uh, the DES, you go through a sequence of uh, lookup tables, but each one of them is describing only one round and only uh, uh, one uh, S-box uh, in the round. The result is cannot be understood what is the value, uh, but uh, I can still check equality between two values. The value itself coming out of the lookup table is some uh, crazy version of the value that uh, should yes. have been there. But if uh, I twice get the same value, then I know that uh, uh, something about the input. So here is the, the basic idea. I'm going to uh, uh, input two different uh, uh, plain text, which differ only in two, uh, uh, in two uh, uh, bytes of the input. And uh, what is going to happen is that after you go through uh, uh, an S-box, uh, you are doing the linear mixing, and the linear mixing might zero the difference uh, as a result of changing uh, the two input bytes. One input byte will have an avalanche effect that will go everywhere. But two different inputs, you go through the S-boxes, which depend on the key, and then you mix them linearly, and it might happen that uh, the mixing will now give you the same value uh, uh, at a particular point. And this I'll detect because I look at the output of the huge uh, lookup table and I notice that my two inputs gave me in the second round the same result. And from this I can recover the key easily. Yeah, so this looks a lot like the, the algebra, based on the algebraic attack. So they would it's indeed... Not no, it's not, uh, but yeah, indeed. Using yes. equalities uh, yeah. as the basis for your understanding of what's going on. Yeah, so I... I, I can talk with you later. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I completely agree that there are much more potential for attack factors yeah, against. Uh, need considerably fewer traces than uh, what you are using. Even <laughs> less than, than 16? Uh, basically, in order to find the keys, I learned just to uh, play with each one of the bytes. But exactly, it, it might be true because from the gray box model, we know attacks which only need one trace, uh, horizontal or vertical attacks, and they, they might very well apply here as well. So I, I, I agree there is indeed lots of room for improvement. So in order, um, yeah, to help people uh, also from industry, because of course we got lots of interest for people who wanted to see how this actually worked, and but also from academia, um, we decided to put everything online. Um, so we have, so this is on GitHub. We have a repository for our plugins, for our, uh, so that's the, the software tracer, for the GUI scripts uh, to attack all these uh, challenges. And then, at least to my surprise, I was, uh, because I'm not from, the, from this gray box uh, attack world, I couldn't find any good open source uh, CPA tool which just applies the regular CPA attack. So uh, together with an intern, uh, we wrote one and we put it online. So hopefully that will, so some of these parts are definitely uh, of interest outside the, this white box work. So 
we're really interested, as people know, about other white box challenges. That would be really interesting. So um, the week before Chess and Crypto, there actually was a white box workshop on the Sunday. Um, and from the eCryptNet um, EU project, they announced that they, at the end of the year, want to start a white box challenge, that people can submit challenges and then other people can break it. So that would be really I interesting as well to see indeed if, because of course all the, there were lots of white box companies and they all claimed that they had all their countermeasures now in place and that it all worked without saying exactly how and why. Um, but yeah, I hope they will participate. People could participate anonymously because then if it gets broken, there's no PR damage for any of the companies. Um, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, but I hope uh, that will be really interesting, both for the cryptographers and the crypt analysts. Um, or if people indeed want to work on this or let their interns work on this, that would be really cool as well. So to conclude, um, software-only solutions are becoming much more popular nowadays. Um, I mean, it used to be DRM, um, but software only, I specifically mean software only in this white box attack model. So I'm not talking about your regular TLS implementations, but really software running on devices owned by the user, so mobile. Um, it's more popular even though there's still no good uh, scheme. That's interesting, right? Yes. So it's weird. So chances are almost one that there is a white box on your mobile device. For instance, to authenticate if, your, if you can install an app on your phone, that is most likely done with a white box implementation because there you also cannot know the key and it's sitting on your device. Um, but the thing which is really boosting everything now uh, is ho uh, host card emulation because lots of money uh, yeah, is involved there. Um, and indeed, so the level of security and definitely the level of maturity of this field is very questionable. Um, it's not at the maturity level of the gray box implementations. So for instance, we completely miss any type of certification. The, in, for hardware implementations, you have independent companies who need to certify your implementation. For the software implementations, they can just say, we are secure, and then you have to believe them. Um, from an academic point of view, it's still an open problem uh, how to even start to design something for asymmetric white box crypto, although all the companies are selling ECC, RSA, everything. Um, because yeah, industry keeps everything secret. So what we did is, so we introduced DCA, which is just a DPA based on software traces, where the software traces are just memory accesses, but then serialized. So you mean that the companies are selling secret public key implementations? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we really hope that, that this helps by people looking more into this area. So that's all, and thanks for all the questions already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. While you were describing the conclusions, I was thinking uh, about the tech I mentioned, and because you are not looking at all at addresses, but looking only at the values coming out of the uh, uh, lookup tables, uh, this is going to be uh, successful even if you permute the order uh, of the entries in your table, and even if you do it dynamically, and in each uh, uh, application of the uh, AES, you uh, change the, uh, uh, the addresses completely, because I'm using only the question of which value came out at a particular point in time, and I ignore the address used. So actually, uh, against uh, implementations that use the most, yeah. most sophisticated one, which is going to give you some trouble, for me it's totally transparent. Exactly. So I think, yeah, there's simply a lot of room for improvement in both of attacks and countermeasures. So I hope, yeah, in the upcoming years. So I know already, uh, because these attacks came out last year, that at least in the universities I visited in Europe, there are now a bunch of new PhD students just working on this topic. So hopefully, indeed, they will look at exactly these topics. That would be really interesting. Short yes. On the one hand, there are always bad industries implementations, on the other hand, you're looking for challenges. Can you just try to break those? So, I, indeed, I really encourage people from academia uh, to, 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 to look at the implementations because I'm, uh, my guess is, so I haven't looked at uh, industrial implementations, um, but my guess is, or maybe they have all updated and used the countermeasures that they are, say they're using because so lots of companies use white box implementations, but they all buy them from a select 
few big uh, white box vendors. Um, so it might or might not work. We didn't try because it's really uh, bad practice for industry to, especially since we're a hardware vendor, to try to hack our competitors. I mean, that's really not done. But uh, for it's done all the time, but it's not published. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, but it would be really good indeed if uh, people from academia would, would try this. I mean, that would also be an interesting paper, I guess. So it's uh, more or less an easy paper to get. Thank you. Thank you.